Thank you, Diana, for that piece. Welcome, everybody. Great to see you on this beautiful day uh, in June. And I want to welcome you to worship this morning. I just want to uh, relay a few messages. Uh, we are um, planning on having a outdoor service at Riverview Estates June 27th uh, at 10 a.m. And uh, so please join us for that. It will be pretty much an all-music worship service. Uh, bring your own chairs, uh, and uh, hopefully we will have good weather like we had the last time. We did it before the pandemic. We were out there, and it was perfect. So uh, look forward to that June 27th. Um, we have a spring congregational meeting coming up this coming Sunday, June 13th, after worship uh, for the election of officers. So please, uh, uh, those of you who are members, uh, please come and plan to, to stay for that. Uh, we're going to have uh, fellowship time now after church outside. So please uh, stay and fellowship with us. And Diane, Paul, thanks for getting some uh, food ready for today's time after worship. Uh, also, uh, we are working on getting the praise band back together. And uh, we are in need of a guitar player. So if you have any ideas, uh, let us know. Anybody who might be able to play guitar for us. And uh, we're going to actually have a meeting after church uh, this afternoon about starting up the praise band. So that's, that's great news. Uh, what else? We need some elders and clerks. Uh, a clerk of session and some elders and deacons. So please prayerfully consider that. Um, and oh, Wednesday night, um, we're going to have a VBS night on July 21st. Uh, and we'll have more information about that to you. But we're going to have a, a one night VBS this, this summer on July 21st. Oh, and Lori and Ned have some vegetables uh, that they brought in that are in the back. And uh, you're welcome to take them home if you would like. But don't take all the radishes. I want a few of them myself. Uh, which reminds me, the church I grew up in, which was way out in the country, uh, Coachville, uh, we did that in the summer. Lots of people brought in excess vegetables every Sunday, and we exchanged vegetables. Uh, so that's awesome. Thanks, Lori and Ned, for that. Any other announcements that I'm missing out on this morning? Except for that, Diane, yeah. We have some very special birthdays in June. So if you could either wave your hand or stand up, we would love to acknowledge those. Here we go. Our first hymn, I Sing the power, Almighty Power of God. Uh, the state of the Christian music during the 1700s was more chanting than actual singing. Church music had become so dull that 19-year-old Isaac Watts complained to his father about this. His father challenged him to write something better. Well, from that moment on, Watts began writing hymns. By the time he died, he had written lyrics for hundreds of hymns, Eighteen of them are in our hymnal, including Joy to the World, We're Marching to Zion, Jesus Shall Reign, Come Holy Spirit, Heavenly Dove, O Bless the Lord My Soul. His goal was to write lyrics to the level of a child's understanding. What said, the children of Israel were commanded to learn the words of the Song of Moses. And we are directed in the New Testament not only to sing with grace in the heart, but to teach one another by hymns and songs. While conservatives objected to the composition of songs that were not word for word from Scripture, Watts reasoned that if one can pray using their own words, then one should also be allowed to sing songs not directly from Scripture. 
I sing the almighty power of God is based on various scriptures about creation. scripture is from Mark chapter 3 verses 20 through 35. Jesus' ministry is really taking off at this point. He's called his disciples. He is getting to be very well known and believers, skeptics, and the merely curious are flocking to see him. Some want to ask for a miracle of healing. Some are looking for signs and wonders. And some just want to see what happens next. So the they in the first verse refers to Jesus and his disciples. And the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him. For people were saying, he's gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebul. And by the ruler of demons, he casts out demons And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. But his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man, then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin, for they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside they sent to him and called him, a crowd was, around, was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, If you'll take your bulletins and uh, please open it up to the uh, prayer requests and uh, the folks listed there. We're going to spend some time praying for them. Uh, But we should remember that prayer is not primarily a to-do list for God to fix and complete. Uh, God knows what's going on already. And he knows exactly what we need. And so prayer is primarily an effort by us to commune with God, to learn how to be with God, and to be led by God. 
And as we grow in our faith, this relationship gets stronger and stronger and we become more able to pray as God guides us inwardly. We can still express the love of God in many ways as we seek healing for others and ourselves. But let's remember that prayer is primarily an effort by us to learn how to commune with God. And so let's do that now. We'll start in silence. Lord God, calm our hearts and our minds that we might enter into your presence. Help us to realize and experience that you love us in this moment, right here and now, just as we are. And you always have and you always will. And as we give you thanks for loving us and accepting us, we share our love and our concern for our family, for our friends, for those in need. And we pray that you would bring healing and wholeness and the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, and peace to those who are in need today. We pray especially for those who are mentioned in the bulletin. We pray also for the Hoffman family and the Trout family at Covenant who've recently lost loved ones. May your spirit bring peace and comfort and hope to them. Lord, may you transform us into the image of your son. That way we may be able to say, as St. Paul did, that it is I who no longer live, but Christ who lives in me. May we experience Christ's presence within us at this moment. And be filled with the joy of your spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Thank you so much, Alice. It's great to see you here. Thanks for, for being here this morning. Likewise. I mean, I got, I got my shot. Yeah, that's great. It's so nice to see you, and thanks so much. Thank you. Well, I began this week thinking that really the main important topic in this passage, which is from the lectionary, is dealing with the accusation that people had that Jesus was being guided by Satan and his reaction to that. So I thought, okay, well, we need to address this issue. And, uh, and then I started to realize how difficult a topic that is to, fr to try to help us understand what is the role of evil spirits and negative energy and Satan I did find one interesting fact. Beelzebub means Lord of the Flies, which I thought that was very interesting. It literally means Lord of the Flies. But I realized that I was in way over my head when it comes to this topic. One of the things I want to point out before I abandon lessons on demonology and go to other matters is our approach to the spirit world and how we come to believe what is real, what is imaginary, uh, and what is practical. And that is that our approach is the same with everything else. We want to love as God loves all things and all people and all spirits. And the best way to relate to negative energies, evil spirits, demons, whatever you want to call that dimension of reality, is to view them with love and compassion. It'd be interesting if we could get a complete survey of all of our church members to see how many, or if any, have ever felt you encountered a demon or evil spirit or negativity. Probably some of us have in our dream state because in our dream state our consciousness is, is in a place that is easier to contact the spiritual dimension. So we've probably had encounters with them in our dreams. But I'm going to abandon that topic because it's so difficult to wrap our heads around and just mention that the one thing that Jesus criticizes here is the accusation that what he is doing is satanic or demon led and so we want to be careful that we don't ever start doing that ourselves and unfortunately when you look down through the church history you will see the church Christians are choosing, accusing other church Christians of being Satan followers or teaching things that Satan is telling them to teach, especially in the early couple hundred years after Jesus when they were debating the nature of Jesus. They really accused each other of this kind of satanic idea. And in this text here, Jesus is saying, that's not good. Because actually what we are ignorantly accusing of being from Satan may actually be from God's spirit itself, working in ways we don't understand. The other aspect of this text this morning is Jesus is talking about families. Your mother and your brothers are outside waiting on you, calling for you, one of the disciples said to Jesus. They were wanting to rein him in because they thought he had lost his mind. And then Jesus responds by saying, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he says, anyone who does my will and follows me they are my mother and my brothers. Jesus was 
a radical, revolutionary teacher in many ways. And for most of us, it's hard to wrap our heads around much of his teaching. And what most of us do is we tend to create a Jesus after our own image, and we follow that. Albert Schweitzer was a brilliant theologian who wrote a famous book that is used in almost all the seminaries, The Quest for the Historical Jesus. And Schweitzer evaluated all of the theologians, the famous theologians, and how they understood Jesus. And one of his conclusions, after studying these theologians for centuries who were writing about who the real Jesus was and what the real Jesus taught, Schweitzer concluded that these theologians created a Jesus out of their own image, out of their own preferences and ideas about who they wanted Jesus to be. We do this all the time, and much of our church culture and liturgies and activities is not really based on the teachings of Jesus. It's based on our own preferences that our culture has had over the years. We can, some churches say, this is the true Bible-believing church. Have you ever seen that on a sign? The, the true Bible church, uh, the one true Bible church. But you'll see that it all depends on how you interpret the Bible, how you come up with that one truth. What I'm suggesting to you is that we need to continue to look at Jesus' teaching and try to examine ourselves objectively. Are we hearing the words of Jesus or are we just creating our own faith and ignoring the difficult ones? And one of the challenges that Jesus gives us this morning is his talk about abandoning our families to follow him. What does he possibly mean by that? I have come to set a man against his father, Jesus said, and daughter against her mother. Jesus says, quote, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself cannot be my disciple. Now, those verses typically aren't used on Mother's Day, I have a feeling. So what could Jesus possibly be meaning in these statements? Well, first of all, he's using hyperbole. He's, he's exaggerating to make a point. So he's saying that we need to follow Jesus as if we hated our family and life itself. As if we had that kind of attitude to follow Jesus, to give up everything else, all that was valuable to us in order to follow Jesus. It's that kind of commitment to Jesus' past that is required. We see this over and over again, right? Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Right? That's a tremendous demand that must be made in order to follow Jesus. Sell all your possessions, right? He says to the rich man, and give them to the poor, then follow me. You know, how many of us, before we became a church member, felt the call to sell everything we had, give it to the poor, and then become a member of the church? You know, the, Jesus over and over again makes these outrageous demands that is required to follow him. And so we have to keep going back year after year after year and asking ourselves, what is Jesus asking of me? Probably one of the biggest challenges that prevent us from growing 
in our spiritual life to become all that God created us to be is our attachments to things in this life. We cling to things in this life as if they were permanent and everlasting. And this clinging, this attachment, causes us to stop growing. So one of the hardest things for us to do is to learn how to let go in order for Christ to come into us and transform us. You know, we do this with our children, right? We call them helicopter parents now, I think, is the new term. The helicopter parent wants to take over every aspect of the child's life and make every decision for them and monitor all their emotions and behaviors and thoughts. And the, the parent, even though the child has received their doctorate and is off getting an interview for a professorship, the parent wants to go along and monitor the interview along with the child. Right? This, this is the controlling helicopter parent. Of course, we know that's not the way to raise a child. There comes a point where you have to let go, right? And let the child live its life, make the decisions needed, learn the lessons, good and bad, of life. There is a healthy letting go. That doesn't mean you stop loving them or caring for them, but you let go. And you allow them to live. And much the same in terms of our relationship with others. That until we learn how to let go and grow spiritually, we don't really have a fully healthy relationship with others. So in one sense, we can only become whole and healthy in our relationship by following Christ and becoming filled with Christ and knowing that our source of love and wholeness and healing is coming from Christ within us and that our source of happiness, our source of love, our source of contentment, the way we can feel good about ourselves, all that is coming from within us as Christ communes with us. And it's then that we are able to have healthy and wholesome relationships with others. We can love and let go. We can love without judgment. We can love without needing anything in return. See, most of the time, how do we love our family? Well, as long as they do the things that we want them to do, you know, we, we love them and we're good to them, but we have demands, right? I mean, there are certain things they have to do to fulfill our requirements as a good family member. I mean, we do this all the time. Because we are loving from an insecure, fearful position. But when you are loving from a Christ-filled position, there's no demands that need to be made in order for you to love this person. There's actually no judgments being made anymore when you love from Christ within. You're not judging your family members' behavior anymore. You're loving them all the time. It's a totally different relationship. Your love never stops. Most of us, we withdraw our love if they do something that we don't approve of, right? We close them off. We give them the silent treatment. I was taught the silent treatment uh, in my family. Rather than arguing a lot, some Italians may be known for you know, raising their voice and arguing a lot, we were taught the opposite, that if, if you wanted to get back at somebody, you gave them the silent treatment. Just shut them off. You didn't say anything for days and weeks. But when we have overcome that and live from Christ within us, you know, all this kind of games disappear. And we can love and accept our family 
which turns out to be, as Jesus is trying to tell us, our family turns out to be all the world. Jesus left his biological family in order to form a new family based not on genetic kinship, but rather upon the gracious barrier-breaking summons of God, says Pastor William Williman of Duke University. He says Jesus got into trouble for practicing scandalously open-handed table fellowship, calling the lost, the orphaned, the prostitutes, those, those evil tax collectors that take, you know, there's nothing worse than a tax collector in Jesus' day. Jesus welcomed them all to his table, into his family. He eats and drinks with sinners, right? Was the accusation against Jesus. He loved indiscriminately. And even as he was dying in agony on the cross, Jesus invited an outcast a somewhat repentant thief hanging on the cross next to him into his family. In all these actions and in many of his parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost boy, Jesus is constantly forming a new family composed of people who had difficulty fitting in their human family. And this is the amazing thing about the church who welcomes all and embraces and accepts and loves all people because we are all part of the mystical body of Christ. And we are reminded of that as we partake of Holy Communion on this day. Let's pray together. Gracious God, expand our horizon that we may see your beautiful family in everyone we meet. May you help us to love as Christ loved. Agape love, unconditional love, love without limits. And you have promised to make it possible for us to do that through your spirit that comes into our hearts and minds and bodies and transforms us into the image of your son. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, at this time, we're going to gather around the Lord's Supper. And hopefully you all remember to uh, get a cup before you say amen. And so we're reminded of that every month when we use these symbols. The body and blood of Christ that comes into us and transforms us. Jesus invites anyone who puts their trust in him to share in this great feast that is Christ. And in his great prophecy it talks about those will come from north and south and east and west and gather at the table. And we will one day be able to experience this together. Let us pray together. Eternal God, holy and 
much. And so as you go out this afternoon, let go of your grasps and clinging to everything and trust God. Completely trust God. 
and open up to the spirit that can bring you joy and peace in this life. May the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.